Hi, everyone. Uh, I will be talking about uh, solid design principles and how to write better code or how to write code that's easier to maintain, extend, and understand. OK. So this is me. I am a software engineer and uh, co-founder of Adeva. It's a, a, developer, a global developers uh, network where we connect tech companies to world-class talent. And working in an organization like that, I've had a chance to work with a variety of companies from early stage startups to Fortune 500. Now, it seems like two different edges of the software world, but they do have something in common. And that's the thing that actually brought me here today. So how is it like to work with enterprises? That usually translates to how is it like to work with legacy code, as some of you might know. Uh, what happens there is that uh, you have to reread the code multiple times. You usually have to jump from uh, one file to another just to follow the, the structure of the code and understand what's going on there. And at some times, you would uh, find yourself looking at the wrong file, which has the same uh, method name, because that's a thing that, that happens often with legacy code. So code is very coupled together. You should uh, always jump from one thing to another. And once you finally understand what a method does, uh, you get to a point where you need to do your fix. Now, this is, again, something that's not very straightforward, because uh, you need to, you, the, the code is not designed for extension. It's very hard to extend it, because it's, again, very coupled together. Essentially, what happens is you spend much more time reading code than you spend writing one, or much more time understanding uh, the existing solution uh, instead of spending that, that time on writing your own one. Kind of looks like this, uh, except that instead of all of this heads popping up behind you in the virtual world, you have endless Slack chats and Zoom meetings and all of that trying to understand how, how the code works. So how is it like on the other end, working with a startup or developing a startup solution. Uh, what happens is you have a clean slate, right? You can do whatever you want. You're usually in charge. I had the opportunity to lead a project when I was at the beginning of my career. But to be honest, I was the only developer. That's why I led it. Uh, but in any case, I was in charge of the whole development process, and I could do whatever I wanted with it. So you can uh, choose your architecture. You can organize the code, whatever you want. But you really should think about it before you do. Now, in early stage startups, the, organizations, the organization is not very good. It's not very, things are not very organized. So we ended up constantly adding new features, doing daily releases. Things changed, changed a lot from one day to the other. And I really didn't have much time to think about the code structure, or at least I, I wanted to think I didn't have enough time to do it. And I always blamed it on, on the organization, or the client, or whatever there was. Uh, and so after a while, the code, entered uh, the, code the system entered uh, maintenance mode. It was an e-commerce product, and uh, we had a variety of, of products with a complex uh, background processes. So uh, we had custom image generating. Uh, we had custom pricing. Everything happened. There were a lot of uh, methods and functions as executing in the background. So two years after, uh, the client comes and asks me to uh, do a simple change. It was adding a new product to the database. Now, you would say it's an e-commerce website, right? That's the only purpose it has, to remove products, to add new products, to sell them to the customers, right? So it should be fairly easy to do. And at this point, I wish I had Spadis image uh, processing uh, package that we heard about yesterday, but I didn't. Uh, so I had to, had to go back and dig into everything I've programmed on my own uh, and find the pieces of code that actually uh, were going to enable me to do this change. And so I spent two, day, uh, spent two days reading uh, the code and, again, jumping from one method to the other, uh, from one declaration to another, from one file to another, uh, just to understand what I did two years ago. And after that, it again took me two more days to develop what I needed to develop, because uh, my own code wasn't developed for extension. And you could probably understand how frustrating it is to go back to your own code after two years of work and don't understand what you did 
Um, and so that's what brought me here today, uh, combining these uh, two different experiences from two different environments who are essentially the same and uh, who point out one same problem, which is not thinking about the code structure when we develop apps. So we will talk about Solid today and what it means, how to use it, how not to use it, what each of the principles, what the purpose of each of the, uh, of the principles is. Um, and for those of you, this, I believe it will be very beneficial for uh, those of you who are not very familiar with what Solid does or uh, kind of understand the basics. And I really hope the ones who are solid and solid uh, would also be able to pick up at least some new perspectives or uh, some, learn something new. So just like a short overview, overview what solid is, uh, what is its purpose. Uh, so the purpose of solid is to make uh, your code easier to maintain. That's one. Uh, the second one is to make your code easier to extend without actually breaking uh, something else that you've developed earlier. Uh, and the third one is to make you, your code easier to understand, which at the end will enable you to do the first things better. Oh, I almost forgot one very important part. It was introduced by Robert Martin or uh, Uncle Bob, who is more familiar to the developer world, uh, in his paper on, on uh, software design principles and patterns, uh, but it wasn't actually named until a while later when uh, Michael Fetters uh, rearranged the, the principles so that they can form the SOLID acronym, and right now we, are, we all reference them as such. So we're going to start with the single responsibility principle, or a class should have one and only one reason to change. I'm going to switch here now because it would be easier to show the code. Now, a good example on the single responsibility principle is uh, one that Uncle Bob uh, usually likes to mention, and it's comparing the single responsibility principle to a clean and organized room. Now, what happens here, and I had an experience uh, when I was little, and I'm sure some of you had it as well. Uh, my room was always a mess, and my clothes were always thrown around to the floor, on the chairs, and somehow, magically, I always uh, managed to find what I was looking for, or at least, I thought so. But anyway, my mom would then come, and she would be very annoyed, and she would say, OK, please clean out your room. Everything has its own place, and everything should be placed there. So this is the main sentence that Uncle Bob emphasizes when he talks about uh, the single responsibility principle and the concept of clean room, that everything should have its own place, and everything should be placed in its own place. So how do we translate that to code? That usually means that a class should always be responsible for one thing, or it should only do one thing. And uh, we usually have uh, multiple classes which are smaller and much more precise, and they have very specific names that define what's uh, saved inside there, what the purpose of that class is. So we have this, small classes with very specific names and very specific responsibility, as opposed to large classes with uh, generic names and all of the responsibilities for uh, the representations they have. Uh, that would, an example of that would be like having a, an employee payroll class and um, an employee time lock, an employee um, leave, for example. And those are the specific ones, and you always know where to find them and where to do the changes. And on the other hand, you have an employee class where you have everything thrown inside and you never can arrange through all of the methods it has. So let's look into a code example for this. Uh, this is a, a simple controller function. It's from a resource controller in Laravel, and it's a simple store method. And you can notice that it does basic things. So it does, a code, uh, it does uh, an input validation at the, at the beginning, uh, which is defining the, the required fields, defining the required format of the, those fields before saving them. Uh, then we have uh, saving the, the user in the database. And at the end, we are returning a response to our client. So basically, what a controller uh, class or a controller method should do, it's only controlling the flow of the app. So it gets an input from the client, it, returns, it operates something on it, and it returns the output. But it should only communicate with other sections from your code for, that, for those operations in, in between. 
the main responsibility of the controller should be getting the input, then returning the output. So over here, we, have, we know a lot. So our, our controller method knows a lot about what's happening in the background. Uh, so we have this code validation. The controller knows uh, what are the required fields, how uh, we are validating them. Then it knows how we are saving things in the database. And at the end, of course, it knows what type of response to return, whether it's JSON or a simple view. So the, the steps that we are going to take here is uh, leaving one responsibility here, which is, again, the flow, and moving everything else uh, outside. Now, Laravel has a very nice way of organizing validation, it, and it's with uh, custom form requests. So you, you have an artisan command for uh, generating this. It's very simple. And what we do here is um, we define the validation uh, rules in our uh, rules method. And then if we have any authorization uh, checks, we do that in the authorize method, but it's, I, intentionally, I intentionally left it uh, blank for simplicity. Uh, so you will notice here that we have uh, the, the whole validation moved into a separate method in a form validator class. And now the second part that we're going to do is separate the database section so the controller doesn't need to know about our database structure or how to handle it. Uh, and for that purpose, we are creating a user repository. And at the moment, this repository is only going to have a create method, which will create our user uh, record. And we moved everything from our controller to our create function over here. Now, if we go even further, we can even remove this uh, bcrypt function because our repository doesn't really need to know what we use for encrypting the passwords. So I would probably uh, create a mutator or something on uh, the eloquent side so that we can abstract that part completely. But again, it's left for simplicity like this. And now, how does our uh, controller look like? Uh, we have, again, the store method. We use a store user request instead of the regular request that we had earlier. Um, and we use user repository instead of the user model directly. So what this does, it, moves, it moved our uh, method from 10 lines of code to two lines of code. Uh, and we, we do the validation even before we enter this, uh, this method. So our store function doesn't, doesn't know anything about the input validation. That happens even before we, we come here. And for all that we know, that's handled once we arrive to the, to the beginning of the store function. Uh, after that, we do the creation. Again, we don't need to worry about how things are created in the background. They just, we just know they work. And we just know that we have some interface to, to that. At the end, again, we, we have uh, this return section where we uh, return the proper value to the client. Uh, now, what's worth to notice here is that our uh, controller now cares. So this is only a method in the controller, but this will, of course, pass to the, to the whole class. And the single responsibility principle works with, both, uh, with all methods, functions, and classes. So it's all entities that we can imagine. It's not only uh, for classes. And the main purpose is to have only one thing in there. Uh, and now our controller will know whether something changes on the client side, so it can return a different output. But other than that, everything else is handled for it, so it doesn't need to care about it. OK? The next one is the open-close principle, uh, or an entity should be open for extension but closed for modification. Now, this one is uh, often very com confusing when you read it for the first time. It's because uh, its uh, name is a bit counterintuitive. Uh, but essentially, it's very simple once you understand it, and it's the one that would save you most time on, uh, most development time in the future if you properly understand it and use it. Uh, so what does it mean to be open for extension but closed for modification? It means that uh, you can extend the functionality of the system by adding new code instead of um, changing the existing one. And a good example of this is um, an open source library or a composer package that, that you use. So what you do is you install uh, the package that goes straight to your vendors folder. You, you have no idea what happens in there. And what you do is you uh, get your interface to that, um, that package that you have somewhere in your source code, and then you write your code around it. So basically, you call methods from there. You use something that you know would be beneficial for your program, but you don't go ahead and change things inside it. You just wrap things around it and 
uh, use it as you need, it to, need to use it. And what happens there is that uh, with open sor source libraries, people use them constantly. They never change them. So once they get to a point where a lot of people, use, where a lot of people are using them, um, they get, actually get very well tested that they can hardly ever break. So they, are, they become as error resistant as possible, and they are very stable at some point. And the goal with the open close principle is to get your system to a point where it's very stable, uh, just because it's tested often and it's uh, changed almost never. Uh, OK, so let's look into an example uh, about this. So this is um, a simple example, again, from an e-commerce uh, system. It's a pay method that handles the payment processing. Uh, at the moment, we only have two payment types, so uh, either credit card or, or PayPal. And um, this method is, is handling, uh, handling the payment uh, processing depending on the uh, input type. OK, let's see the payment class now. Again, it has this, uh, both of these methods, so we can use them for processing later. It doesn't have anything in the source code, uh, but it's, the, the general picture is much more important for this example. So now what happens when we want to extend our payment options? Wire transfers are, again, a very popular option and very common. And some people in some countries like mine, uh, we don't have PayPal. We, we can pay by PayPal, but uh, we often uh, require to, we, we often want to use wire transfers when we, when we uh, pay online. Uh, so this is a, a valid option to add. And what happens here, how we added this, is adding another else in our pay method, which will uh, call the appropriate function on the, on the payment class. And then in the payment class, uh, we add the appropriate method for processing the, the wire transfer. Now we have a, a, two, a class with uh, three different methods. They are processing the payment in three different ways. And our controller has uh, three different if analysis uh, that call the appropriate functions. Now what will happen next? You probably guess it. We'll need a coupon payment. So we'll add another function in the payment class, another if in the, in the controller. Then we'll need uh, cash on delivery payment, then we'll do the same, and we can do this until we run out of payment options. And this is something that violates the open close principle, because uh, we get to a point where we change our classes and our methods so often that they can never become stable. And even though they seem unrelated, uh, they are very coupled together, and a change in one function could cause a change in, in the other. So how many people here had the experience to do some bug fix, Everything tested, everything works properly, deploying it, and then it breaks somewhere else. Like what Kai was demonstrating here earlier, fixing one rep report and then breaking another. Come on, it's, it's OK to confess. Yeah. So this is, this is the point of, of the open source, uh, open closed uh, principle, to get us to a point where we don't do uh, such, such mistakes because our design doesn't, offer, doesn't allow us to do such mistakes. So how are we going to solve this? We're using the, the factory pattern. Uh, we have, so for those who are not familiar with it, it's a behavioral pattern that allows us to create different class instances on, on runtime. Uh, and so we don't need to understand what method we are going to call when writing the code. It will happen automatically depending on the, on the client selection. So we have a payable interface. This one will define all the methods that we will need to use in our, uh, to implement in our classes. And then we have three different um, classes, which are the credit card payment, uh, PayPal payment, and wire payment, who all implement the, the same pay method. And now we go with a simple payment factory that has only the purpose to initialize the appropriate payment depending on the selection of the client. So uh, depending on what's chosen, it returns the uh, appropriate object type. Now how does our controller look like? It's a simple pay um, method, which doesn't have any of those uh, checkings that we had earlier. It only initializes the payment factory, so it doesn't depend on, on, on any concrete class at the moment. It depends on something that will tell it what class to use depending on the client selection. Uh, 
Uh, and then, uh, depending on what's selected, we initialize the appropriate class and we just call the pay method on it because we know that we have it. And what happens now if we want to add the coupon payment or the uh, cash payment or whatever else we want to add? We just create a separate class. We tell the factory how to initialize that new class depending on uh, the client selection, and everything just works out of the box. So we've uh, lowered our time of extending the code significantly just by enabling uh, to do that by adding code instead of changing code. That brings us to the third one. This is the Liskov substitution principle, and it's introduced by Barbara Liskov, a computer scientist who uh, created this math-like formula, which is a bit complex to dig into right now. But in simple software words, uh, it only states that we should be able to change every, every concrete class instance in our code with anything that implements the same interface. That works for derived classes, uh, who should substitute their, uh, their parent classes. And uh, the main, reason, the main uh, purpose here is that our code should be able to get the expected response no matter what class we send to it, what instance we send to it. So our, the client should not be aware of any change in our, in our source code. A good example. Uh, a good example with this is uh, changing uh, database engines. So for example, if you're developing an app and you decide to use file system instead of uh, defining the database engine from the beginning, and you have a simple repository which handles all of the file reading and writing, uh, so you uh, transform everything into array and then pull it, manipulate with it, and store it or whatever you need to do with that data. And now after you finish this app, if you want to move to a database engine, probably use um, eloquent uh, models, uh, then those will return collections instead of arrays. So you will create a simple interface. You will implement all of the same uh, methods. When you use it in your app, you've done everything properly, but you haven't made sure that your code behaves exactly the same way. So you get collections instead of arrays, which again fails the program. And this is a violation of Liskov substitution principle that we will try to comply with. Now, this is one very popular meme. I'm sure most of you have seen it so far. It's part of a larger solid series, but what it uh, states is that if we have a uh, rubber duck or battery duck or rubber duck, uh, which looks the same as a regular one, quacks the same as a regular one, but it can't really, it does everything, it's not alive, that then it's definitely the, the wrong abstraction. So I tried to translate this into code. Uh, I have a duck class, which is, an, I mean, imagine that I have because I haven't shown it in here. But it's a duck abstract class, which has these uh, three methods, quack, fly, and swim. And now I want to add a rubber duck in my imaginary program. I uh, create a class rubber duck, extend the existing abstract duck class. And I have to uh, extend these three methods because uh, my rubber duck can't really quack, fly, or swim the same way that a normal duck would. Uh, so this is your first clue that you're violating the Liskov substitution principle, because if you need to overwrite all of the methods that your parent class has, you're probably doing something wrong, because you're not reusing any of the code that your parent has. Uh, OK, next clue that we're doing something wrong is this uh, fly method, which only throws an exception. So our duck, our rubber duck can uh, quack or swim, probably be with the help of a person, uh, but it can't really fly. If we throw it, it will fall down. So what we do in the fly method, we just uh, throw a new exception saying that a rubber duck can't fly. And this is good, but again, it violates the Liskov substitution principle, because if the client selected a rubber duck and then selected a method fly, which was enabled to them, and then saw the program breaking, then something is probably off. So how we can fix this is coding by contract instead of uh, extending an abstract class. So we can have three different interfaces, quackable, flyable, and swimmable interface, who all, implement, who all uh, have all uh, these three functions, quack, fly, and swim. Uh, and then we will implement only the uh, interfaces that we need for the rubber duck. Uh, 
And in our case, that's the quackable and the swimmable interface. So now we get to this. We have a rubber duck that implements uh, the quackable and swimmable interface. It implements quack uh, and swim in the appropriate way, just as it did earlier. But it doesn't have the fly method because it didn't really use the fly method. So this is cool. Our client will, not, will now not see the fly method is available because our rubber duck can implement it. So we're OK. We have quack and swim only. Now let's look into any of these functions. They're basically the same. So for a duck to swim, it needs a person to throw it in a, in a tub. If there is no person that can do this action, then our duck cannot swim on its own. So what happens here? We have, if there is a person to help our duck swim, then OK, return the expected value. The duck is swimming. But if there is not a person who can help us do that, then our program will fail again. And this is the third clue that you are not complying to the list of substitution principle because you have a condition. Your, your program is behaving the appropriate way in some cases, but in some cases, it's not. So how can you really fix this? Uh, there's no way to, to force a fix with a code. You've noticed that I've tried doing that with this uh, type hint returns. We have strings over here that are uh, the required values that the function should uh, should return, but they don't really work well with uh, an exception. So no matter what your type hint is, an exception will, will always pass by it. Uh, it would work for that uh, database example that I mentioned earlier. So in some cases, it can help you. But in the cases that it can't, you can just use it to, to understand what your code needs, needs to do before writing it so that you can code more with intent and use this type hints to, to help you uh, know what you need to do before you complete a method. So es essentially, you need to do everything that, that you can to make sure that your methods really behave the way they should as they're defined by their interfaces. The fourth one, it's interface segregation principle, or which states that no client should be forced to depend on anything it doesn't use. Now, this is a nice example. Uh, of the inter interface segregation principles, uh, principle. Here we have a headset with uh, many different plugs, plugs and uh, we have a phone that we want to connect to them so that we can listen to some music or do a call or whatever we need to do. But now we have multiple interfaces attached to the same thing that we want to use, and we are not really sure how to do it. So with the interface segregation principles, principle, what you do is you segregate the interfaces, you tailor them to uh, the individual needs of the client. Now, with iPhones, this is way on the opposite direction because you get to a point where you can reuse code. So basically, you need to stick your ground somewhere in the middle, not to segregate a lot and not to come with an example like this. So what the interface segregation principle states is that a client should never be forced to depend on methods it doesn't use, or it should not depend on anything more than a method it calls. And this is a much bigger problem in uh, languages like Java, for example, which are compiled languages, because changing one method in a class will affect all of the classes that have methods which depend anyhow on that class. So even though, if, even if I depend on only one method in a large class, whatever else changes there, it will cause my, uh, my class to recompile. So basically, what we need to do is to replace large interfaces with uh, smaller ones or replace large objects that we depend on with small interfaces. This is a code example. It's uh, a subscriber model, which extends the eloquent model, but again, has some uh, other functions. So it has a subscribe and unsubscribe, which uh, updates some fields in the database. And then it has get notify email, which is important for us so that we can get the appropriate email to send our subscriber uh, notification. Now, what happens when you want to implement the notifications? We have a class uh, named notifications with only one function, uh, method sent. And this method sent is depending on the subscriber which means it depends on Eloquent, it depends on uh, all uh, functions it has to communicate with the database, and essentially knows what database engine we use and all of that, even though 
uh, we don't need any of it. And it gets a message object so that it can, it can send a message. Uh, another thing that we need uh, to put attention on uh, here is our dependency on the subscriber method. If for any reason the model uh, class changed, that would cause our notifications class to change even though it doesn't really depend on it. So how we are going to fix this, we need to imp uh, create uh, an interface. And now we'll need uh, separate interfaces, but I'm just going to elaborate on this one. It's a notifiable interface, which only has the get notify email method. And this interface essentially says that our subscriber needs to implement the get notify email uh, method so that uh, we can get their email and then send them a notification. And how it transforms our notifications class, our send uh, method does not depend on the whole subscriber object anymore. It depends only on the notifiable interface uh, and again calls the same method in the same way. So basically, we just abstracted this part. We depend on an interface and we depend on only one function. So now our code here would only change if something inside that function changed. And this is the last one. It's dependency inversion principle, which says that high-level modules should not depend on low-level modules, that both should depend on abstractions. Again, what does this mean? It's, more, uh, it's better explained with an everyday example. Uh, so we have a socket here and a lamp. And if we want to get electricity, what we do is uh, we usually go find a socket and plug it in. We never dig a hole in the wall and try to find a wiring and then wire our lamp directly. So how this transfers to code is, in our code, the interface is the socket, which gives us the opportunity to, to do what we want to achieve, what we want to achieve. And that interface works the way it should work, no matter how everything uh, in the background is handled. So no matter, we are not interested in how the wiring is uh, handled in the background. We just know that we have an interface that can provide us to everything we need from that wiring in, in the background. We need light, we need the electricity, so we only use that interface. This is the abstraction part. And the concre concretion part, or the low-level modules, are the wiring behind the wall. So everything that's happening on the low level of our code, everything that's like database engine, uh, uh, data manipulation, and all of those sections which happen in the background, they are the low-level part, they are the wiring, and we don't really uh, care about them or should depend on them. And the purpose of this is to be able to change the implementation of the low-level code. So for example, to change the, the database engine, like Gabby mentioned that it's very hard to change database, uh, databases in, uh, in your code. But if you code them the proper way, then it can be made easier. And with uh, this dependency version, when you depend on abstractions only, then you don't really care about the database you use. You just care about how to get that you can uh, get the, the data from the database and that you have an interface that provides you with it. So you don't care about anything, and you can change everything in the background so that uh, your code will continue to work properly even after. Now this is back to our first example with the repository, but now we have an index method. It's essentially the same. Uh, what we do is uh, we get all users that were created uh, a day before, so in the last day. Uh, in real world, you would probably need some input from, from the client here, setting a date range or something, but it, uh, this is simpler, so let's stick with this. Uh, so we have aware, we have uh, concrete fields from the, from the database table. And what happens here is our index method knows what our database structure is. So if we want to change something in the database structure, then we would need to go here in our controller. We will need to go probably in many different controllers as well to change the code there, uh, too, just because our database uh, changed. It also knows about how to get the data from the database or what to communicate with directly so that it can pull it uh, for, for usage. Uh, you will notice that this, again, uh, also violates the single responsibility principle. But most important for this part is that it violates the dependency inversion. So how should we fix this? Again, we have the same repository. So we switch this uh, get section to the, to the user repository. We have a get after date 
method which returns all of the users that are registered after a certain date and basically does everything that our controller did, only it has a separate space for it. It complies to the single responsibility principle. Now, what happens? If you remember in the first example, we depended on the user repository instead of depending on the user model directly, and that helped us with the single responsibility, but it wouldn't help if we would uh, be changing the, the user repository we have right now with a new file, a new class that would work with MongoDB, for example. Uh, so that's why we need to abstract this in, uh, in, a, in another level and use an interface, depend on an interface which will only tell us what functions to use, what methods we need to uh, implement so that we can achieve what we want to achieve. And that interface right now only has two methods. It has the get after date and uh, create method which help us do uh, what we need. And in our controller, we just switch the, the dependency from our user repository to a user repository interface. So basically, the dependency inversion is an inverted dependency injection where you only depend on the, on the abstraction. Everything else is, again, the same. So what this helps, uh, helps us do is uh, when we need to change the database engine, we create a new class. We implement all of the methods in there that are defined by, by this user repository interface, and then we just change the binding in, the, in Laravel uh, to bind this user repository interface to our new uh, repository class. And after doing that, everything else continues to work properly, given that we've uh, complied to the list of substitution principle. So you'll notice that these principles are all uh, related to one another, and that you usually can't implement one without uh, focusing on the other one, uh, but what's important is to uh, make sure of the context that you want to use them in and uh, make sure that they really help you achieve what you want to achieve. So that brings me to some words of caution about solid. And this has happened a lot. People uh, try to achieve solid because they, that makes them uh, look good with their colleagues or other developers. And there are always some comments that you're not uh, complying to solid, or your code is not clean, or you're not doing test-driven development. And those comments are simply wrong just because they don't uh, care about the context. So what you need to do here is to make sure that solid will help you achieve your bigger goal. And the bigger, the bigger goal is, uh, easier maintainability for your software, easier extensibility for it, and make it easy to understand what you've, do what you've done and other people to understand what you did. And this is one example of solid gone bad. It's a developer, it's a question on uh, Stack Exchange that a developer asked, uh, which asks how to refactor away from the single responsibility uh, principle. Uh, so the, the big problem here is that uh, their team leads tried to comply to Solid that much that they uh, over-fragmented their code, so they had so many different classes with so many specific, so two specific responsibilities uh, that they ended up uh, depending on too many uh, different classes, which made their code hard to maintain. So if you get to a point where trying to use Solid actually makes it harder for you, uh, to, to maintain your code or to extend it, that means that you're probably doing something wrong and that you need to go a bit slower with it. So try to think about the context, try to think about what you're achieving and whether it really helps you uh, achieve a code that's easier to maintain. Now this is a second example which will probably not be very, um, how do I say, lovable by some of you, you over here. It's uh, the index PHP movement, which uh, for engineers is uh, really causing a sick in the stomach sometimes. But it's something that um, really has a bigger point. And the point is that if your app is so simple that it, uh, it doesn't need any architecture or it doesn't need any formal structure, uh, then you probably don't need to exaggerate with any of it. Now, I'm not suggesting that like Peter did here, you get a single file and you dump everything inside it. But what I suggest is that you can uh, take advantage of the elegant syntax, for example, elegant structure that uh, Laravel has for simple apps. You can make use of the eloquent models directly instead of uh, creating unnecessary abstractions with repositories in case you, you have a simple app that, that doesn't need it. 
Again, the context, the, the common sense, those are the things that are important to you when you think about whether you need to use uh, SOLID or not. So to recap, the purpose of SOLID is to help you uh, make a code that will make your lives easier, to make it easy to extend, maintain, and understand. And it requires you to spend much more time writing code so that you can spend less time reading it later. So it comes with tr trade-offs. If your code is already easy to read or it's very simple, then using SOLID would probably make it more complicated and will make it hard for you to, to maintain it later. So you should always use it with caution, and you should uh, be careful about the, con the context where you use it and use it together with uh, common sense. Uh, and again, there are principles, they are not rules, so you're not always required to, to use them. Uh, the final and most important one, then, at least uh, for me, is that solid is your tool, is not your goal. So it's what should help you achieve better code, better structure, better, easier development life for you, uh, not something that should, uh, you should strive to, to achieve as such. So use solid to uh, build better code, don't try to achieve solid as it is. That would be all. Thanks a lot. If you have any questions or...